The following few minutes contain me blathering in a spoilery way about all the media listed on screen right now. If thou ist an anti-spoilers puritan, get out of here and come back when you get time. I want watch time, views, and fame. Thank you. This is the moment that defines my love for video games. The summer of 2018, a year after Breath of the Wild's release, was when I was able to get my hands on it for the very first time and boot it up. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't the first time I had watched the introduction and this reveal sequence specifically. I've watched the same scene more times than I could even count by that point. I had scoured through Let's Plays after Let's Plays, reactions, speedruns, everything about Breath of the Wild, I pretty much had already absorbed. But still, the first time I got to play it, it felt special. The music swelling as Link dashes towards the edge of the cliff to reveal the vast reaches of that cozy, vibrant green. I had played open world games before, like any Indian boy with a crappy laptop and a foolishly bold attitude of, hey, I know that downloading stuff from sketchy websites is bad, but I've never gotten a virus before and who's to say this will be my first? I grew up playing GTA San Andreas on my crappy laptop and, uh, I was technically correct since the only time I did get a virus was through Discord and not downloading stuff from the internet. But this felt different. San Andreas was cool and all, but this, this was something else. It was limitless freedom right in front of my stubby little fingers. It was everything that I could do and would continue to do right there in one shot. Well, of course, Breath of the Wild is like what? Six years old now, holy hell, and now Tears of the Kingdom is all the buzz when it comes to Zelda. Curiously, a similar thing did repeat in the gaming sphere though, only a year ago with Elden Ring. Also, what Elden Ring is technically two years old now? What, what, the, what, the, what the hell? <clears throat> Elden Ring 2 has, if only a little more subtle, open world reveal after the tutorial. The moment you lift up the gate after the starting area, your eyes are stabbed. <laughs> with this gorgeously extensive sight of the lands in between. The draw distance has never been larger, the graphics has never been crisper, and the sheer feeling of awe and excitement and overwhelmment has never been stronger. There really is something special about seeing the world, not just parts of it, but all of it at the same time. Of course, I know it isn't technically all of it, but it is a lot of it. In Breath of the Wild, you are this little guy, this short king, this minuscule monarch, this miniature potentate with a little ponytail facing the entirety of this new Hyrule. Most of it is in ruins, and nature has started to reclaim it. Nature, in fact, is probably the subject in this shot. Think of the boss fights in Breath of the Wild or even in Elden Ring. Most of them are against these insanely tall and strong beings from the Blights to Elden Ring's gods and demigods, both culminating with their biggest creatures as bosses with Calamity and Dark Beast Ganon taking up more than the screen and the same with the Elden Beast. The camera, whenever we enter into a fight, especially when we lock onto the creatures, tends to take a low angle position behind the player, since of course both are third person games. Such positioning not only helps in playing the game better since you can see what the boss is doing and act accordingly, it also helps in aesthetically cementing their sheer size and by extension, their power. We are this tiny little person battling this mountain. Isn't this also what is seen here and here? Instead of demigods or goo monsters, we have the vast ever enveloping expanse of nature, of the world. In both the games, the world itself is quite literally set out against you. It contains all the hurdles you face in the game. It is home to all the big giant beasts that make you look insignificant in comparison. In Breath of the Wild, the world or the structures of nature are directly a challenge to Link. The game's well-acclaimed climbing system only being well-acclaimed due to its prominence which is directly being facilitated by the world. 
It's kind of interesting to see that I've died more times due to fall damage or drowning or other environmental factors than I have to actual enemies. The amount of times I overestimate Link's stamina and try to climb higher than what's possible without a break and plummet to my death is... The world is quite literally against Link. But saying that is also kind of wrong, isn't it? I mean, Link is a part of the same world. The tools he obtains, the food he eats, the people he meets, and the stories he progresses are all parts of the same world. The Deku tree, with whose help the plot of the game literally happens, is literally a tree. I'd like to be a tree. It's literally the symbol for nature. All the weapons ever were created using technology that was developed from the world itself. The four main Sheikah runes we are provided with are all based on manipulating nature. Magnesis is used to manipulate magnetic things. Cryonis is used to traverse water. Stasis is used to goofing around. And the bombs are used to do bullet time wind bombing. I don't know what those terms mean. I like to watch speedruns sometimes. In Tears of the Kingdom, it's doubly true, with one of the new rune abilities, Ascend, being something that makes traversal easier. The world is very much a frightening yet interesting character. It's huge and breathtaking and by extension, also terrifying. Just like the ruins of the once prosperous kingdom of Hyrule, one day it will claim us all. Hell, just like the fog that consumes the castle containing the calamity, even Ganon, an embodiment of all evil and death in the world of Zelda, isn't above the world. The world, existence, consumes all. The third act of Annihilation is a sequence of scenes that I periodically think back to. I saw the 2018 movie a year or two after its release and ever since I've only watched it one other time excluding the one time I rewatched it for this video. Can you tell the amount of effort I put into this? I'm literally the most oppressed class in the world. Subscribe? And yet still its final scene seems to have grabbed some part of my brain. Of course, I'm not a genius for this, I'm not finding an overlooked scene from an underrated film. No, Annihilation can be seen in many sci-fi horror recommendation lists, and its last scene is also quite popular with film folk. Film folk. Sounds very obnoxious, which is good, I guess, because it does its job representing what it is meant to represent. But, if you have not seen it or are not aware of Annihilation, I am talking about a 10 minute or so scene right at the end of the movie where our protagonist, Dr. Lena, who is a biologist, makes her way into a lighthouse. You see, a meteor has crashed on Earth and as time has passed, more and more of the area around it has started to display very unusual behavior. The wildlife and vegetation has mutated into something terrifyingly beautiful. And this new mutant nature has started to expand and take over man-made structures, covering them with a sheet of mutant flowers, grass, and plants, and infesting the whole area with mutant animals. More interestingly, the people sent inside the slowly expanding zone that they dub the Shimmer never come back. Hm, that's what they call my dick. All except for Kane, Lena's husband, who left Tottenham. I don't know why I said that, that's so random. Anyways, Lena's sent into the Shimmer with a group of five other women, and their goal is to make it inside the lighthouse. Lena does, and inside the lighthouse, she encounters this. Its skin iridescent and metallic. It mimics Lena's movements. She's scared. She tries shooting it, to no avail. She tries to run. No. It forcefully attaches itself to Lena and almost suffocates her against the door. The scene has basically no dialogue, the ten minutes passing by with the two humanoids in a slow and hypnotic dance-like motion, slowly studying each other while also asserting one's own existence over the other, only to be met with sharp approval. 10 minutes void of any explicit or comprehensive information, 10 minutes of utter beauty and horror. I say beauty because it 
genuinely is beautiful. The aesthetics of the shimmer are immaculate, insanely vibrant and overflowing with life, with nature. I do wonder what the romantics would think about it. The romantics viewed nature to be divine. Not just that it was made by God, since theism isn't a necessary fact of being a romantic. Nature was transcendental. It was so vast and all-consuming. It housed us and also took us when our time came. And when our time came, we re-entered nature. It was the basis of all of existence. And this wasn't some crackpot theory either. Spinoza, who although cannot be explicitly labeled a romantic, was able to progress the problems that had plagued philosophers like Berkeley, Descartes, and so many others with his natural philosophie. René Descartes couldn't really figure out how the gap between thought and materiality was filled. Where Descartes and Berkeley and the like turned to God in how God unites thought and the world or soul and the body, Spinoza recognized that the dichotomy itself was misguided. Spinoza formulates that there is not thought and body, but one thinking body. Thought is simply an attribute, a feature of the body itself, and the body, of course, being facilitated and being a part of nature. Nature thinking itself. Nature is the end-all be-all for the romantics, the very essence of all existence. The shimmer is quite explicitly compared to cancer. It's like the cells of the earth have turned against it, a part of nature outgrowing it and invading the rest of itself. What the five of our main cast experience inside the shimmer confounds them. They're all women of science, a biologist, a psychologist, a physicist, a geologist, and a doctor. And they do try to comprehend what is happening, but they can't help but try and convince themselves that what they're seeing isn't true. That they're in a bad dream. They can't help but not understand. How can they, in the immense existence of something other, something out there, they can't help it but cower. Each one of them, as the story goes onwards, gives in to the sublime. A mutant animal claims one. The other deludes herself in the face of all this horror before sharing the same fate. Another simply walks in and lets her body be one with the shimmer and turns into one of the flower structures. What else could they have ever done? The Burkean sublime. The overwhelming beauty and unease that arises from realizing the omnipresence of nature violently and calmly forces us out of human finitude. One of the weirdest as well as one of my personal favorite feelings or vibes that I've ever experienced is watching Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's a 1968 film, not a 2001 film. That is called Fraud. It's a film directed by the grumpy moon landing man that's about a group of astronauts on a mission that they aren't completely privy to the details of, accompanied by a creepy AI computer named Hal. However, that's not how the movie begins. It begins like how the title would suggest, an odyssey, beginning with the very birth of mankind. Well, I guess that part isn't fraud. Apes trotting around the roadless, skyscraperless, manless desert, making noises at each other and fighting. The sequence that follows is a portrayal of the ape discovering the tool. One ape discovers the remains of some weird animal in the desert. It holds a random bone and strikes the remains of the same animal long dead and decayed. It learns that it can use the bone to smash things, and due to this knowledge of tools, its tribe is able to reclaim territory from another. Oh, and of course, there is this weird alien monolith there, but th that doesn't matter, don't, don't worry about it. After the discovery of the tool, there is a pretty famous transition, a match cut, where Kubrick cuts from the footage of the bone slowly free-falling in the air with that of a sophisticated spaceship floating in space. See. 
This vibe I mentioned earlier is a tricky thing to describe as it really is something that evades my intelligible consciousness. It's an atmosphere of wholeness, one of awe as well as alarm. The fact that what we are, what we have become, and what we have created, and what we were, are all there. Their very existence is troubling to me. I don't know if I'm sounding like a schizo, but it really is. This is a reason why I have always been attracted to grand narratives spanning vast timelines. Breath of the Wild immediately comes to mind as we just discussed it here in this video, but another such story is a video game I finished recently, Chrono Trigger, with art design from Akira Toriyama. Rest in peace. One of my personal favorite areas in the game is the 12 million BC era. One reason being that that's where Ayla is from, who's a very strong and cute muscle woman. Uh, and, and the other reason is that it is basically ground zero of the story itself. But in a seemingly contradictory sense, my other favorite time period is the future when everything is destroyed due to Lavos, which is technically also the ground zero of the story of Chrono Trigger. Dasein, the being there of existence, is fascinating to think about. And isn't this feeling, this vibe, also that of uh, the sublime? Look, I like cool drawings of teenagers punching each other. To be fair, I have thus far only covered one explicitly shown in battle anime on the channel, and ironically, Gurren Lagan does not count as teenagers punching each other since it's the robots doing it. I have always liked cool shit happening. I especially like it if it's very cool. Oh, and did I mention I adore cool anime fights? One of the fight scenes, although I wouldn't consider it as one of the best ever made or anything grandiose or self-absorbed like that, but still is something that I consider to be a tightly written and gorgeously animated scenes is the fight scene that occurs midway into the first season of Mob Psycho 100. And this fight, as well as the connection to the Sublime, is something that I saw in a Wisecrack episode, so yes. Thank you, Wisecrack man, or uh, company, I guess. Mob is a shy kid born with utter devastating levels of psychic energy. However, unlike what other kids like himself would do, I'm looking at one edgy white-haired torso man, nah, you would not win, Mob is hell-bent on not using his powers to get ahead in life, instead working and developing himself just like how the normal people around him do. Except that Mob is a little soft boy who has an internal percentage counter that if reached a full 100%, lets loose of Mob's inner demon, if you will. And of course, this counter goes up throughout the arc as Mob experiences emotionally stressful situations. This particular fight occurs between himself and another natural-born esper, Hanazawa. Hanazawa, unlike Mob, is what you'd expect a natural-born power machine to be like. He uses his powers to build a hierarchy around him and neatly places himself atop of it. He's not at all driven by moral codes or egalitarian principles. He knows what he can do, and he isn't afraid to do them. However, as it will be painfully clear to anyone aware of what kind of story Mob Psycho is, the fight is clearly an unfair one. Mob is literally the strongest. But of course, Mob holds back. The scene builds up our sweet, sweet expectations of watching the bully being put into his place. Mob's emotional meter rises from a 50 to a 100% in 10 minutes of them fighting and he breaks down. Or in other words, his gates break down. And when that happens, Hanazawa is left naked and vulnerable. He's shown the facticity of his impotence at the grand gaze of the universe. He experiences the absolute power of a being he once thought himself to be, but now realizes that he cannot even begin to grasp the complete magnitude of this incredible existence. It's a humbling moment for him. A similar essence can be extracted from the surreal third act of the end of Evangelion, especially the first time you watch it. 
I don't think that anyone who's ever watched it has gotten what is actually going on the first time around. Big pale ray with boobies and then the earth go red and lights and, and Shinji's gay crush and then big Ayanami head and a notion that is red. However, to most, if not all of us, Evangelion felt like something insanely other. We may not have completely cognized the concepts that the show presents us, and we may not even relate to Shinji who is in a robot that's at the center of a surreal cataclysm, but we did, at least I did, feel something oceanic and profound under the layers and layers of incomprehensible surrealism. Of course, I'm not implying that Evangelion cannot be understood by the faculty of reason, just that Trying to do so jerks us right back into non-understanding the first time around. There are of course other anime which have similar events like Angel's Egg, Serial Experiments Lane, and to an extent, Sunny Boy. Their surreal imagery is incredibly wallpaperable. They are striking and absolutely interesting, but they elicit a weirder experience than stuff we have talked about with Annihilation and Zelda. For those, nature, a prime subject of Edmund Burke's formulation of the sublime, it's about time that I bring up what the fuck I'm talking about in this video, is terrifying as it puts us at odds with our own existence. Nature so big and scary and I'm so small. The sublime is present in the externality of the utter beauty internal to nature. But Burke isn't the only philosopher man to goon about the sublime. Kant, who can't do anything without bringing up how the mind is minding, characterizes his theory of the sublime as inherently rooting from the mind. It's not the terror of insignificance we feel from another much more powerful and superior entity, but a negative kind of pleasure born from the mind's incapacity to understand. The mind is attracted to beauty, but simultaneously repulsed by it due to its inability of comprehension. I feel for Hanazawa when Mob sends him flying into the ends of the sky butt naked alongside his school. It's a total incapacitation, an absolute punch to the noggin of Hanazawa. <laughs> the term mind break that we use to describe moments like this is almost perfect. No, I'm, 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 not, I'm not talking about hentai, please, no, that, that's a different sort of sublime, some other day, maybe. Uh, however, Kant can't help but repeat his historical position of always contributing loads to an investigation while being extremely far away from the actual truth itself. I didn't grow up playing Call of Duty, unlike most people making videos about games on the site, but the title itself is something I've always been aware of. For a time of my life, the term gaming pretty much stood for Call of Duty. And due to this reason, when I finally got a laptop, although not a very good one, I decided to try one of them out for myself. And due to my system being not very good, I decided to go with COD 4, Modern Warfare, an older title. And what do I think about it? Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's hard to guess based on my political leanings inferable from my past videos, or even by the fact that I seem to not really cover any traditional FPS games. It's not really that good, and I don't think I even bother to finish it. But there is a reason why I bring it up in a video like this. And the reason is that one sequence in that one early mission called the bog, where you play as a guy named Paul Jackson and you die from a nuclear bomb deployed by the Russians. It's supposed to be a shocking scene. You die. That never really happens. And the moments before your death feel ethereal. You slowly crawl out of the rubble and come face to face with this. A mushroom cloud. But just describing it like that feels sacrilegious. It's more than that. It's... Speaking of media that I found ideologically disagreeable, Oppenheimer was a banger. It was masterfully shot, well paced, tightly written, and oh no, that's- oh, oh buddy, I didn't realize that Marx turns into Proudhon when he speaks German. I love how quantum physics and the material he studies appears 
to Oppenheimer. It's those erratically repeating mechanical sounds that grow louder as the camera zooms into Killian Murphy's molderingly intense face. It's those abstract sparks, flames, and rays of bright yellows. It's those raindrops falling in those puddles. Those brief moments are littered throughout the film, growing in intensity until they grow into a quite literal explosion of sound and visuals in the latter half of the movie. See, the explosion, the mushroom cloud, is probably the symbol of a spectacle. It's a symbol of total destruction. It's frightening to the bone and it's big. I don't think I will be burnt at the stakes for giving it the title of the sublime. I have never witnessed one myself and I truly wish that not only I but you too wouldn't have to witness one firsthand in our lives. Witnessing it through a video game I find politically infuriating and mechanically boring itself is something that bloomed in me extreme emotion. Oppenheimer's third act did the same but like a million times more effectively. But there is something that I have to point out here, as I have laid out the so-called rules or definitions for the Kantian sublime, and that's that there is nothing to point out here. The mushroom cloud is a mushroom cloud. The death, the destruction, the explosions, they're all just that. There is nothing to comprehend here. They're devastatingly simple. Kant was wrong. There is nothing beyond raised titties. There is no ding an sich, no being in itself beyond the world of the phenomenal. All there is is this infuriating materiality. It's a world of surfaces. You break through one to discover more surfaces. There is nothing underneath it. And this lack, this negativity of a positive depth is exactly what is felt and seen in these media. The being, facticity of things other to us, a lack of depth in them, a lack of explanations, of underlying rules, the absence of a face behind the mask. Here, we have made our way to a highly Hegelian observation made by none other than this channel's billionth mention, Slavoj Žižek. And yes, I will be mentioning him and all others that I've brought up through this video as we move forward through the life of this channel. Uh, except maybe Burke, I don't know. Quote, The sublime is an object whose positive body is just an embodiment of nothing. Unquote. We are already in the midst of the thing in itself, rather than never reaching there as per the reasoning of Kant. And what exactly is it that we experience in the face of this radical negativity? Well, it is exactly what we have been experiencing with all the stuff I've talked about thus far. An awe for its twisted beauty, interpenetrated by a deep and absolute terror stemming from the subject, i.e. ourselves. Okay, maybe now you have identified the sublime as positively manifested negativity, or as obscene materiality, or whatever you got from the past few minutes of me yapping. And Maybe you have identified why exactly we feel weird when we come face to face with it. However, as you may or may not have noticed, with the exception of one, all the rest of the theory we've discussed comes from dead people mentally jacking off about weird things they saw. What about now? I mean, the ever open fields of Breath of the Wild, the enchantingly gorgeous shimmer of Annihilation, the pre-human apes of 2001 A Space Odyssey, they no longer exist. Where can you see wide green fields, unrestricted vegetation, and unscarred earth on a daily basis? There are not too many places on earth like that anymore, and the places that do exist will probably not in the future. Nature is no longer the predominant force we have no choice but to grapple with. It is no longer the end-all be-all. At least it no longer feels like it. We seem to have transcended nature, to have transcended naturality itself. That's why the new era of the sublime belongs to the mushroom clouds and other spectacles man-made. And uh, th there is another thing that's man-made that is both awe-inspiring and terrifying at the same time which fills me with dread. It's Spider-Man, friend or foe? Uh, no, it's, it's capitalism. Frederick Jameson's characterization of the sublime recontextualizes the concept to be talking about not nature, but the rapid proliferation of capital and technology under capitalism. Unlike back then, the other of our society is not nature, not, not anymore, but technology. Just 
Think of how modern day horror stories are less about freaks of nature and more about evil AI going unchecked or killer robots. This new sublime, or often named the postmodern sublime, is what may be seen in the presence of the mushroom cloud, or my favorite example, the city of Midgar in Final Fantasy VII. Midgar is a giant city that's heavily blanketed with metallic grays and piercing whites that feel transcendent. The characters, the inhabitants of the city, feel like ants engulfed within this massive structure of steel. The postmodern condition is the condition of individuality, the feeling of being lost within the gargantua that is the modern global network of capital. In my knowledge of media, this condition has never been portrayed nearly as perfectly in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Haha, <laughs> look at that. We're finally starting to tie things up now. Kubrick portrays the humans of post-interstellar travel as infantilized. This is a pretty common observation as well as a clever one. The first time we see a human of this era is him sleeping like a baby as a tumbling nurse-like figure approaches to restore the flying pen that he held in his hand while sleeping. Because of low gravity, everyone looks like toddlers stumbling their way through space. The food they eat look like baby food, and once we are shown inside the main ship itself, aside from two humans, the rest are in deep slumber. Humans need no longer evolve as technology does the evolving for them, and thus we have started to walk backwards. As the movie progresses, technology and by extension HAL seems to have growing control and dominance over the characters, all until the ship reaches where it was planned to reach, that being Jupiter, where another one of those tablets or monoliths that I mentioned earlier was recognized and, and our sole survivor, Dave, experiences this often named the Stargate sequence. This. 10 minutes or so of Dave experiencing whatever this is, is one of the most memorable things I've ever witnessed in my life. When I say 10 minutes, I mean undisrupted 10 whole minutes of just this. Beginning with a flurry of random color tiles traveling inward into the middle, played with an eerie choir, followed by other weirdly composited and distorted footage of landscapes and, and spacescapes all interlaced with sudden interruptions of Dave's eyes. This is perhaps the epitome of the sublime in film that I've seen. Technically, this isn't technology. This is not some robot or VR, but it is only possible through the means of technology. It only happens because of the advancements we as a species made with technology, both in a meta sense, as you know, to make the film, Kubrick had to use technology that was unheard of at that point, but also in an in-story sense, as without the spaceship and all the other technological things, they could never have got to Jupiter and Dave could never have experienced the Stargate sequence. The whole film thus far captures the final stage of humanity right before it takes the next step in evolution, which happens after this sequence, where a baby can be seen floating towards the Earth. In that sense, the Stargate sequence is the most visceral depiction of the sublime. And keeping with something we have already established, the Stargate sequence does not really mean anything. It is horrifyingly shallow in that there is no hidden message beneath this surreal flurry of lights and color-adjusted landscapes. Uh, they simply are. Okay, but what do we really do with this, the, the sublime? Well, the third season of Mob Psycho 100 was a delight to watch. It came out recently, at least relative to the other anime I've talked about thus far on the channel, and it absolutely did not disappoint as to it being the end of the story. The end, of course, is addressing the problem that's always been there from the very beginning. The problem is not a last-minute external villain group or god, but the very mechanic that drove the show itself. Mob's percentage counter. More specifically, what exactly it was the percentage counter concealed. 
The final arc of the story leads to a point of Mob's acceptance of the fact of his immense power that he's been repressing, him going completely powerless and his other taking over as the people in his life, the people that he loves and who loves him, try desperately to snap him out. I love this. For one thing, it is one of the coolest moments ever that I say I like cool things, culminating with the end of the character arc of one of the most fun characters ever written. And on the other hand, what Mob Psycho 100 gets absolutely right is self-consciousness. I described Mob's other as a terrifying force of nature. And I didn't do that out of some weird writing aesthetics or something. I use the word nature specifically because Mob's situation in this new context is quite exactly like ours. Mob is not really Mob without his other. Likewise, we cannot really exist without our other, that being nature. Throughout the centuries, we have always perceived nature or existence as an abstracted other that we must conquer, something that quite directly gave birth to the postmodern condition due to our proliferation of capital that we described with Jameson. But isn't that simply doing what Mob did? Isn't it repressing a fact about ourselves? Maybe not deliberately, but invariably yet still. The ending of Annihilation is not a perfectly balanced or satisfying one. The film begins with the Shimmer holding dominance over humanity. Its third act shows Lena fighting back and establishes her dominance over it, but oh wait, no, that's not the Lena we started with. Annihilation is about self-destruction. A quite popular reading of it, yes, but also an apt one. It portrays self-destruction, not just the character self-deluding, self-sabotaging, and literal self-harm, but also in its very plot. The conflict that arises from the existence of the Shimmer itself is an act of self-destruction. The existence of the self itself is an act of self-destruction. I recently finished the profoundly nightmarish masterwork of Cormac McCarthy, Blood Meridian. One of the popular parts of the book is when the character of uh, the Judge, who, if you know, you know, states, whatever in creation exists without my knowledge exists without my consent. <laughs> He does so when he's examining and actively recording the world around him into his little notebooks. When one of the other characters asks what that has to do with killing birds, which he was doing, he retorts, the freedom of birds insults me. I'd have them all in zoos. That'd be a hell of a zoo, the judge smiled. Yes, he said. Even so. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot voice act. I see the judge's rationale of thinking of himself as the master of nature and of existence as akin to our own collective identity as the human species. We have done what the judge says of doing. We have, speaking figuratively, caged all the birds. The earth is forever scarred, its protective layers punctured, its temperature all over the place. The judge is us, and we are the judge, in this respect at least. I bring him up because he provides us with an answer. Not THE answer, because hell knows there really isn't one, but AN answer. An answer that is essentially a denial of the sublime, of nature, and a complete submergence in selfhood that we have accepted through our obsession with the modern system of capital. We build skyscrapers, we scar the lands, we, we reshape the earth, we dig holes, we cage the birds. However, this isn't the only answer to the sublime. Mob's story ends with a complete self-identity with the other. A complete left turn compared to Blood Meridian and Annihilation. The separation is destroyed. He no longer views his other as another. He experiences complete self-acceptance, or in Hegel's terms, self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is when the subject realizes itself as substance. The climactic scene of Annihilation is the best depiction of this self-alienation that I can remember. Ten minutes of a primordial otherization. Conflict. Conflict. 
remember, not with an other, but with herself. We are one and the same humans in nature. Nature isn't something to be overcome, but is something to be realized as one with ourselves. Remember the appearance of the metallic dude in the scene? Remember how it takes the form of Lena right before she escapes? The sublime, the enigmatic inner sense of obscene materiality, the terror of incomprehension. It, I think, is the direct result of the said self-alienation, something that we must overcome by achieving self-consciousness like mob and achieve complete freedom. At which point, maybe we won't need to feel afraid of the beauty of life. Alright, that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'm so fucking tired. Uh, follow me on Twitter, like this video, uh, subscribe to the channel. I'm very close to getting monetized. And maybe I'll start a Patreon so I could, you know, be like other video essayists and like. Okay, uh, thank you for watching this video. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Like the video, subscribe. I, I already said that. Um, follow me on Twitter. I already said that, I think. <laughs> Comment down below what you thought about the video. Uh, Thank you. Here's to self-consciousness and freedom, my friends and comrades. 